This is the Conscious Economics Podcast. Your co-hosts are two women who found themselves in careers on Bay Street, but decided that there was something missing. So here we are. I'm Rhiannon Rosalind. I'm your co-host and the CEO of the Economic Club of Canada. I'm also the co-founder of Conscious Economics. Hi, I'm a seal, the CEO of Conscious Economics and a financial therapist. Now, we call ourselves economic healers, and that is a term that I'm sure nobody has heard before, but we really believe that if we want to heal our systems and create a more equitable society, it starts with actually healing our relationship with money and the economy. When you join us on this podcast, you'll be exposed to courageous conversations that help us examine, heal, and redefine the relationship we have with money. Join us on this journey as we co-create the new economy together. Hi, everybody. This is Estelle from Conscious Economics, and we're here with my beautiful co-host. Hi, I'm Rhiannon, and we are excited today to talk to you about financial enabling. And I don't know what that means, and so Estelle is going to explain. (laughs) Well, in simple terms, financial enabling is help in the short term that actually hurts in the long term. Oh, um, amazing. I'm sure I'm guilty of that times a million. So (laughs) let's talk about it. Yeah, there's so many things to decipher with this topic. It's actually one of the very common uh, money disorders so it's very very important for us to start understanding it and unpacking it uh, primarily it shows up in the dynamic of a parent and a child that's primarily where it shows up it doesn't mean that's exclusive to this dynamic or that relationship but it's very common when parents uh, support their kids financially and they do so out of goodwill because they don't want their kids to be in trouble and there's a million different reasons to why which we will get into in this episode Uh, but ultimately they end up hurting their children especially when that um, help turns into dependency Mm. that's essentially the line that's usually crossed when you just don't know how to create these boundaries which often are really missed in these conversations and and we'll get into some of the data here soon but just let's stop here for a second and and just um review what we already discussed is that something that you feel is common in your surroundings so i was jealous of all those kids that were being financially (laughs) enabled by their parents and i i grew up in a neighborhood but my mom uh, pretended that we lived literally like across the tracks um so i ended up going to a school with a lot of wealthy young people um so i wasn't in the school that i was supposed to be in so i was sort of the odd person out in terms of i was in a different socioeconomic um class than many of the people that i was going to school with and so i really watched that i watched and and in this case it was wealthy families really supporting their children which is no problem but then it went really on and on and on like into adulthood even where some of these um, people were kind of still living off of their parents yes. Um, yes. living off of their parents to a detriment where yes. now it's become a real issue mm-hmm. and they don't have their own ability or, or initiative or understanding of how to kind of get out there because they've had so much comfort mm-hmm. and support from their parents so I've seen Absolutely. that happen a so lot. it's really great that you said that because like you I used to feel a sense of jealousy uh, to parents who were capable of supporting their kids because I didn't grow up in that uh, privilege at all just like you I share that struggle growing up but what's interesting actually if we just look at demographics emerging adulthood is a new term that was created when um there like if originally it was like a quick transition like you're a teenager boom you're 18 you're an adult and within a few years you're done your school you get married you're having kids but now this transition became much later in life and and that there needed to be a new terminology between uh, teenage years and adulthood so the term emerging adulthood came about and originally it was from ages 18 to 25 and recently it became from 18 to 34 mm. and the reason being is there's so wow many 18 to 34 18 to 34 okay. is the new emerging adult okay and some of the factors it makes me feel so much better about myself <laughs> i've just I only become an adult a few know, years ago <laughs> pretty much i'm not even an adult yet i just turned 32 but the interesting thing about this is when you really think about why that is you you realize we are in um a very unstable employment situation higher 
housing costs especially in major cities like we live in toronto we hear well it's unbelievable and it's it's not even it's not even normal for people to be able to comprehend especially those you know generationally who are like what's the problem here like i bought a house and it's like guys yeah it's a really different world and it is truly more challenging absolutely and then low wages that at at you know at best support you on a paycheck to paycheck level and at worst would never enable you to create that financial health and saving strategies and investment strategies well in the rise of the gig economy so Mm -hmm. so many people now are employed in the gig economy where they don't have benefits they don't have that lasting security they don't know maybe when their next shift will come or their next Mm -hmm. paycheck will come so these are all very real things yeah yeah and all these things definitely impact the transition into adulthood because adulthood is marked by the time in life where you can become independent and you can start seeing your parents as equal adults and there's a lot of relationship dynamics that get that get created that are very tricky when uh, parents continue to support their kids financially and there's layers to that but one of them is that relationship dynamic is now being jeopardized because you're Anytime your uh, your kid is dependent on you, then you're conti- as a parent you're continuously feeling the um, entitlement to make their decisions on their behalf almost. Yeah. So these financial ties usually don't come without any uh, power struggles, and that's why some of the family structures really really struggle when when uh, money is in the equation because of all these unspoken rules that come with that. Absolutely. I remember the whole thing like my house, my rules, like yes. that sort of thing. And so sometimes when you're financially linked to a parent and I've seen this happen with even friends of mine who felt like they needed to keep other parts of their lives even a secret because their parents were helping them financially and wouldn't agree with some of the lifestyle choices mm-hmm. maybe that they were making. So there's this whole dynamic that's at play which is really a difficult thing to navigate for sure yeah so there's different factors that take place in actually determining how much help is being given to begin with and some of these factors are first the family's value around money that's a big one like like I know for example some of my friends um her she comes from a wealthy family but her parents believe that money should be earned for it to be appreciated so even when she's in trouble they actually hesitate strongly to give her financial aid which wouldn't even be hurting them because they have plenty of it and that creates such a weird dynamic and resentment between the kid and the parent it's frustrating Uh, it's very frustrating and and it's a lot to do with how they value well what's their value around money um and and how it showed up in their life my mom (laughs) did the most frustrating thing to me when I was younger I got it I wanted a car and it was like well you're gonna have to figure it out you're gonna have to get your license you're gonna have to get your own car and you're gonna have to get your own insurance and I remember that she would not put me on their insurance plan she forced me to go out and find my own insurance but I was a 17 year old and so typically speaking you would get added to the Mm. household policy and I could pay for that but no it was like I had to go out and no one would insure me and I ended up finally getting insurance that was so ridiculously expensive that I ended up after maybe six months getting rid of the car and literally moving out and being like I I could just be paying rent rather than doing this so see y'all later and I left and it was just like a very frustrating thing because it made no sense like what was the difference um you know in yeah it'll be day. interesting to, to yeah. discuss that with your mom like what was it for you that made you create these boundaries or rules rather but another uh like some of the other factors that per- play a role obviously the parental resources like how much your parents have money sure. obviously that plays a role it goes without saying but then also the reciprocity requirements from the parents and this, this is where it gets really tricky because um, a lot of times especially it's a very common thing that parents who have financial resources pay the, for the education for their kids. And it gets tricky if the kid, for example, wants to pursue uh, an educational path. That's not necessarily something their parents want to support. And and it's almost becomes very conditional where I'm like, I'm going to support your choices, but only if it's an alignment with something I would rally for. But if you want to just pursue your own thing, then um, I'm not going to be 
supporting you financially for that and th- this is a very common scenario yeah. I think I've seen it so many times in my own office but also in my own community and surroundings as well uh, where parents feel that how they choose to either spend money or not spend money uh, they use it as a means to control their yeah, kids it's manipulation manipulation and at its best. absolutely absolutely but and then you're taking it so you feel like you have to. Yeah. And this is, I, you know, I know that this doesn't only just show up in, in the sort of parent-child dynamic. It shows up in a lot of other dynamics of too, especially with spouses. And, and, and there's all these layers to it. And I'm sure we can get into that indefinitely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. This podcast is brought to you by our sponsor, RBC Investees. Backed by expert human advisors, RBC Investees is a smart, online, automated investment service that allows you to invest with low effort and low cost. Open your first RBC Investees account and pay no management fees for your first year. Plus, start investing with as little as $100. Simply visit rbcinvestees.com slash getinvesting and sign up using promo code AA407. Another factor is how close um, you are to your parents. And I'm not saying close as in like how your how your relationship is. Even geographically, uh, there's a uh, statistics to show that the more geographically close you are to your parents, the more likely you are to receive uh, financial support from them. And I was like a little bit um, confused by that. But then when I looked into it, there's actually a theory about social maximization utility maximization and that's because there's this hidden notion that if uh, I'm a parent helping my child financially that child later on is gonna take care of me in my later years Mm -hmm. and these are like very subconscious beliefs and even back in the days the whole concept of marriage and bringing kids and whatever it's not based on love it was all about survival sure animalistic uh, you know things that we have ingrained in our identity Uh, so essentially there's that these subconscious things that also play a factor like how close you are proximity to my existence also increases the chances that you'll be able to support me in my later years so I also remember that there was a different expectation placed on boys versus daughters and so a lot of the times I would hear people say like oh we need to have a daughter so that someone will take care of us because it wasn't an expectation on boys to take care Mm. of the parents but it was an expectation put on daughters yeah so that's really interesting as well I I have some uh, statistics not statistics sorry um references to here to make here in 2017 Swartz which is a uh, economist said that there's a positive impact on parental financial transfer to adult children in early years of adulthood but then there remains to be this cultural stereotype that if you're actually making financial support to your kids um, then you're burdened with unambitious children who just don't do not want to move on and because of that subconscious stereotype that's very cultural and widespread a lot of parents act upon it so even when they are in the position with where they're capable of making that help they don't uh, b- however our episode is really focused on financial enabling and that's the other extreme when parents are making that help even at their own detriment so they're making the help even if they are sabotaging their own financial health as a result of it because i see a lot of parents especially now we talked about the real estate market how difficult it is and so there's this generational wealth transfer of parents that are helping their younger sons and daughters with the down payment or to get into you know the real estate market and i see that working really well and Mm -hmm. those kids actually end up paying their parents back and all of those things but it lets them get that leg up to be able to get into the market which is fine but you're talking about a situation where it's gone to now an enabling route where there's a you know an un a different difficult scenario that's happening as a result of this financial support that's going down a bad road sure to make it clear let's talk about some signs of what that can look like actually so first you've given so much so often that your loved one is just no longer trying to make it on their own so that's one sign okay like 
they're not even trying given anymore. Be- yeah. Not necessarily giving up. They're not even trying because they rely on they you. They rely on you. So mm-hmm. the dependency is created. The other one is you give money to others even though you can't afford it or even though it harms your own financial stability. So, for example, you stopped contributing to your own retirement fund because uh, these extra savings that you had are now going towards supporting your um, kids with um, any payments whether it's their housing a lot of it's very common as well if your kids have grandchildren um you 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 start feeling guilty because it's the grandchildren that are being impacted by your kids inability to support themselves and that's where you feel like you need to step in because you care so much about your grandchildren as well so that's a very tricky situation the third one is when you start buying clothes at walmart when your own kids are buying clothes that are like designer clothes or something like that so it's a very I mean, this is a symbology. It could not necessarily apply to just clothes. It could also be like you're driving a certain car when your kids are driving a better car, but it's your your own money supporting that specific purchase. And lastly, and this is a really interesting one, when you start feeling a sense of resentment or anger about giving money, but you just don't know how to say no. Mm. Well, and that's, I think, with any any area of our lives where we start to feel resentment means that we're lacking a boundary. Yes. There needs to be a boundary yes. put there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is really, it's a, it's a difficult pattern, especially right now in the times that we live in where there is so much economic uncertainty. Like I know that um, I obviously didn't grow up with, my parents didn't have the ability ability to really support me or help me so it wasn't it wasn't that they didn't want to they just like f- actually couldn't um and so I took that on as I need to figure it out I mm-hmm. need to find my own way um but I know that being able to have that support especially in a time of need is a nice thing like it's a beautiful thing to be able to do that for your kids it's just when it goes on too far too yeah, long absolutely or, yeah there's this really interesting book i thought I, I would quote the author his name's gary buffoon and the book buffoon yeah i'm not sure if i'm saying it right but okay. I hopefully <laughs> uh reach out to me if i'm not um but the <laughs> what i really found interesting is the title of his book to begin with it's called choking on the silver spoon oh um and it's uh keeping your kids healthy wealthy and wise in the land of plenty so i thought it was a really interesting title but what he said is that parents like to think they're altru- altruistic like they, yeah. they like to think they're doing good and they like to s- think that they're actually helping their kids uh, when they're financially supporting them uh, to satisfy their own needs. But research shows time and time again that financial support um, actually are making the kids less productive. And there's so much research to show why that is. Uh, so just to make that point, uh, I think for people like you and I who grew up in poverty or grew up in a underprivileged households, some of our fire is fueled by the fact that we grew up in these environments because we became go-getters as a result of it and we wanted to like plow paths that we didn't otherwise would have had the motivation or eagerness to plow Mm. uh, had we just had it come easy to us uh, in a way and I again there we're not trying to generalize here for anyone which I know is kind of goes without saying but I always kind of say it anyways but I think one of the things that happens with financial enabling too is that there's lots of layers to these things so especially I know because I just have a lot of awareness around addiction issues and I grew up in a household where my grandmother was financially abling enabling my uncle who ended up after a divorce coming back and living with her and then she sort of took on that role again as like full primary like caretaker but he was a grown man and he was dealing with some different issues including addiction issues and it was like that financial enabling that was you know his his addiction issues which it's a disease and a mental health condition but he was not able to work in the same way because of that but because she was financially enabling him he wasn't hitting the rock bottom that he would have otherwise hit that may have helped him to get sober Mm. sooner um, because a lot of the times for addicts they need to hit this like rock bottom place and um, a lot of people talk about that and you know in the community about like a high bottom or a low bottom but when someone's enabling you sometimes they're preventing you from hitting that bottom Mm. and they're doing it because they love you and they want to support you but they're actually enabling not only the addiction but also the financial enablement enablement that goes with that so it's something that I really watched in my household and I watched a lot of different 
folks that I know struggling with that. And it is so hard because, you know, when people are challenged, whether it be with an addiction, a mental health issue, something that's preventing them from working, what is the answer? Like, what is the right thing to do? Yes. Yeah. So actually, we at the conclusion of this episode, we are going to get into some tips of how to manage enabling so that you can uh, lessen the impact. But before we do that, I thought it was really interesting to also talk about these motivational emotions that ultimately create these behaviors to begin with. And there's a lot of guilt and fear associated with why parents even go about financial enabling when they clearly know it's hurting them and it's hurting and jeopardizing their own financial health and future. But a major one that I personally saw a lot with my clients is really trying to make up for mistakes that you think you're doing as a parent and using money as a means to do so and that is very common for divorced parents specifically they feel so much guilt and shame about the divorce about having especially if you're the one who left the marriage then you try to make it up to your kids by um compensating them financially and supporting them financially so that's a huge one that shame and guilt uh, about but but another one it's if if, if it's not the divorce uh, parents who are very busy at work and mm-hmm. very much workaholics also they are feeling guilty for not spending as much quality time with their children so they also try to compensate with it with money so that's another common one Another reason, I- another one is if parents did not have this lifestyle themselves growing up, mm-hmm. they try to really provide it for their kids because they feel like I didn't have it and of I really course. want my own kids to have it. Yeah. Um, and lastly, it's also interesting to reflect on uh, parents who feel that their relationship with their kids would simply be jeopardized if they say no. Mm -hmm. And again, that goes back to the boundaries and the importance of boundaries that needs to be created in dynamics as such. Um, And these relationships are not secure to begin with if if boundaries as such are going to jeopardize the relationship to begin with. Like it's not healthy. I just want to say that sometimes when we hear, you know, these lists like this and, and then I know some of us may be listening and like this twinge of like, Oh my God, do I do that? Or Mm. have I done that? And I just want to kind of out myself. Like I've done all of these things on this spectrum. It's really hard being a parent. It's really hard going through the ups and downs of life. And one of the first things that I felt instantly when I became a mom was this like guilt feeling like now I'm responsible for these, these children and I'm not perfect. Like I'm a human being. And I think we put this expectation on parents all the time in society that we have to be perfect. And the truth is, is that we're not, we're all on this journey to self-discovery, to learning, to growing. And so for me, I, you know, I've talked about my divorce before. I was the lever. So I was the one leaving and where I enabled the kids was not necessarily with money although I guess it's linked but it was like food like the kids were having like more treats at my house and more things and I didn't want them to ever feel like they were you know unhappy or sad with me it was like I was avoiding that by giving them this Mm. fun and giving them this thing so that they would still like coming to me because the scariest thing in the world for me would to be to hear them say that they didn't want to be like with me or they prefer something they prefer to be with their their dad or whatever it is and that was early in the divorce something I really grappled with and I had to really sit with myself and it's still something I'm kind of working through if I'm really honest and it's just it's hard it's challenging so of course anyone who's listening admire you for outing yourself and sharing these vulnerable stories because they are extremely important to Um, help individuals relate but also get honest with yourself like when we get honest here it's really uncomfortable for us sometimes to do so but we're hoping that it's a gateway and an invitation for you to reflect on your own behaviors reflect on the emotions underneath because ultimately when these emotions go unaddressed it's going to continuously perpetuate and behavior that's not serving you and every time we talk about one dysfunctional money behavior it's really around the underlying thoughts and 
beliefs and emotions that truly create that behavior yeah. that we're trying to address. Absolutely. So 100%. to leave you um, and to summarize a lot, I mean, we can go on forever talking about all the different layers to this, but I really wanted to enable you. <laughs> Funny, I use that. Yeah. <laughs> I enable you with some, I, sh- I should say empower you. I want to p- empower you with some tips or tools to, if you find yourself grappling with this behavior, like what can you do about it? So yeah. let's discuss four, okay. four, four takeaways. Four takeaways. I'm taking them away. <laughs> Go for it. So the first one is holding budget summits or another... A summit yeah. now. A conference in the living room. Uh, we could, we'll call it something more fun, I guess. But it's a family money meeting. Okay. Because a lot of the stuff we shared earlier about the difference in family values actually create how parents go about um, managing this money. And a lot of these things are not discussed. Mm-hmm. So kids sometimes just are the recipient of these behaviors without understanding the motives behind Mm -hmm. them or what's really happening so when you're actually able to sit down with your kids and uh, explain to them your actual financial situation what your value system is why you're doing what you're doing and bring some context Mm -hmm. to these to these decisions then you're able at least to bridge that gap and 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 um, prevent it from turning into resentment because mm-hmm. resentment is, is inevitable when you as a child feel that your parents have the means to help you and are choosing not to. Sure, yeah. So that's a huge Makes one. Makes sense, yeah. Um, especially if your parents are um, making the point that their own retirement or their own goals are in jeopardy uh, b- by helping you and if they're able to like really support you through this conversation sure. that it's ver- that, that it, it's that much more important and I always create spaces for my clients to um, invite them to make money rituals as part of their life whether it's a conversation between you and yourself first yeah between you and your partner and then when we bring family it's now even more people involved it becomes more messy sure. but it's that much more important yeah um so the second one is setting a time limit and th- what that means is when somebody's used to you being um their um source of income or source of support and your financial crutch you can't just wake up one day and say okay i realize this is not useful to either of us really yeah, i'm yeah. hurting yourself i'm hurting myself and i'm hurting you you can't just say okay i'm going to just stop it it's important to put a plan in place and put a deadline to so when people that know exactly yeah, i think that's fair yeah to that when makes a lot of sense exactly so yeah. set a time limit create a plan and work on it collectively collectively so that you're truly not hurting that person even further by deciding that you're just going to cut them off right away. The third would be to really start putting more thought behind your gifts, your financial gifts, um, and really think about is this gift supporting or is it enabling? Uh, mm-hmm. So just start introducing this language in your in your life even in, in, and have this conversation again with your loved ones. So have this question constantly being reinforced every time you want to make that financial commitment. Mm-hmm. Am I hurting or am I helping? Yeah. And lastly... Um, get your children the help they need. It could be a career advice. It could be a therapist. It could be a coach. Uh, so get them to invest in themselves to truly figure out what their next steps should be. Uh, it could be a financial advisor as well. It could be a, a financial therapist. Or financial <laughs> therapist, absolutely. Um, so so that is a way for you to support your children. But yes. and, and, and what I would say, actually, if I want to step out of that, think or strategize creatively about how you can support your kids without it being a financial support mm-hmm. because your your intention is to s- still support them yeah but finances are not necessarily the only resource so get creative and think to yourself okay my child is in trouble so for example if uh, if it's not paying for your child's um daycare bill maybe it's you volunteering to take care of the kids for a few hours a week that's a whole nother can of worms I think that we can talk about but this is so interesting and I think that you know points well taken and and you said it yourself that when we actually start to look at these behaviors when we look at these patterns when we bring consciousness to them that's how we can make the change if we don't even know that we're doing them we can't make the change so if you're listening today you find yourself in an uncomfortable situation where you're financially enabling someone or you're being enabled by somebody else take the time to have the conversation 
uh, because it does go a long way. Absolutely. This is always our invitation. So please visit us at ConsciousEconomics.ca. Drop us a line. uh, Follow us on Instagram at ConsciousEconomics and really share with us your stories. How is this resonating with you? Uh, You know, what are you taking away and how are how is this changing the trajectory of your own decisions and behaviors with money because this is where it's all at so thank you for joining us in another episode and we'll see you next time thank you this podcast is brought to you by cpp investments at cpp investments they never lose sight of the long term they invest the canadian pension plan fund to help provide financial security for generations of canadians They diversify the CPP fund across geographies and asset classes to access the best investment opportunities and generate sustainable long-term returns. The fund is now more than $400 billion. To learn more about their investment performance for Canadians, visit cppinvestments.com.